Join me on my journey as I explore wealth in all areas of life. I'm your host, Mindy Kinnis, and this is The Lucrative Society. All right, we're back with the Science of Getting Rich read-along. This is part three, which will go through chapters six, seven, and eight. Chapter six, how riches come to you. When I say that you do not have to drive sharp bargains, I do not mean that you do not have to drive any bargains at all, or that you are above the necessity for having any dealings with your fellow men. I mean that you will not need to deal with them unfairly. You do not have to get something for nothing, but can give to every man more than you take from him. You cannot give every man more in cash market value than you take from him, but you can give him more in use value than the cash value of the thing you take from him. The paper, ink, and other material in this book may not be worth the money you pay for it, but if the ideas suggested by it brings you thousands of dollars, you have not been wronged by those who sold it to you. They have given you a great use value for a small cash value. Let us suppose that I own a picture by one of the great artists, which in any civilized community is worth thousands of dollars. I take it to Baffin Ray and by salesmanship induce an Eskimo to give a bundle of furs worth $500 for it. I have really wronged him, for he has no use for the picture. It has no use value to him. It will not add to his life. But suppose I give him a gun worth $50 for his furs. Then he has made a good bargain. He has use for the gun. It will get him many more furs and much food. It will add to his life in every way. It will make him rich. When you rise from the competitive to the creative plane, you can scan your business transactions very strictly. And if you are selling any man anything, which does not add more to his life than the thing he gives you in exchange, you can afford to stop it. You do not have to beat anybody in business. And if you are in a business which does beat people, get out of it at once. Give every man more in use value than you take from him in cash value. Then you are adding to the life of the world by every business transaction. Side note, we call that over-delivering, and it's good to do. If you have people working for you, you must take from them more in cash value than you pay them in wages. But you can so organize your business that it will be filled with the principle of advancement and so that each employee who wishes to do so may advance a little every day. You can make your business do for your employees what this book is doing for you. You can so conduct your business that it will be a sort of ladder by which every employee who will take the trouble may climb to riches himself. And given the opportunity, if he will not do so, it is not your fault. And finally, because you are to cause the creation of your riches from formless substance, which permeates all your environment, it does not follow that they are to take shape from the atmosphere and come into being before your eyes. If you want a sewing machine, for instance, I do not mean to tell you that you are to impress the thought of a sewing machine on thinking substance until the machine is formed without hands in the room where you sit or elsewhere. But if you want a sewing machine, hold the mental image of it with the most positive certainty that it is being made or is on its way to you. After once forming the thought, have the most absolute and unquestioning faith that the sewing machine is coming. Never think of it or speak of it in any other way than as being sure to arrive. Claim it as already yours. It will be brought to you by the power of the supreme intelligence acting upon the minds of men. If you live in Maine, it may be that a man will be brought from Texas or Japan to engage in some transaction which will result in getting what you want. If so, the whole matter will be as much to that man's advantage as it is to yours. Do not forget for a moment that the thinking substance is through all, in all, communicating with all, and can influence all. The desire of thinking substance for fuller life and better living has caused the creation of all the sewing machines already made, and it can cause the creation of millions more, and will whenever men set it in motion by desire and faith, 
and by acting in a certain way. I'm laughing about all this conversation about sewing machines. <laughs> you can certainly have a sewing machine in your house, and it is just as certain that you can have any other thing or things which you want and which you will use for the advancement of your own life and the lives of others. You need not hesitate about asking largely. It is your father's pleasure to give you the kingdom, said Jesus. Original substance wants to live all that is possible in you and wants you to have all that you can or will use for the living of the most abundant life. If you fix upon your consciousness the fact that the desire you feel for the possession of riches is one with the desire of omnipotence for more complete expression, your faith becomes invincible. Once I saw a little boy sitting at a piano and vainly trying to bring harmony out of the keys, and I saw that he was grieved and provoked by his inability to play real music. I asked him the cause of his vexation, and he answered, I can feel the music in me, but I can't make my hands go right. The music in him was the urge of original substance, containing all the possibilities of all life. All that there is of music was seeking expression through the child. God, the one substance, is trying to live and do and enjoy things through humanity. He is saying, I want hands to build wonderful structures, to play divine harmonies, to paint glorious pictures. I want feet to run my errands, eyes to see my beauties, tongues to tell mighty truths, and to sing marvelous songs, and so on. All that there is of possibility is seeking expression through men. God wants those who can play music to have pianos and every other instrument, and to have the means to cultivate their talents to the fullest extent. He wants those who can appreciate beauty to be able to surround themselves with beautiful things. He wants those who can discern truth to have every opportunity to travel and observe. He wants those who can appreciate dress to be beautifully clothed and those who can appreciate good food to be luxuriously fed. That's what I'm talking about. He wants all these things because it is himself that enjoys and appreciates them. It is God who wants to play and sing and enjoy beauty and proclaim truth and wear fine clothes and eat good foods. It is God that worketh in you to will and to do, said Paul. The desire you feel for riches is the infinite, seeking to express himself in you as he sought to find expression in the little boy at the piano. So you need not hesitate to ask largely. Your part is to focalize and express the desire to God. This is a difficult point with most people. They retain something of the old idea that poverty and self-sacrifice are pleasing to God. They look upon poverty as a part of the plan, a necessity of nature. They have the idea that God has finished his work and made all that he can make, and that the majority of men must stay poor because there is not enough to go around. They hold to so much of this erroneous thought that they feel ashamed to ask for wealth. They try not to want more than a very modest competence, just enough to make them fairly comfortable. I recall now the case of one student who was told that he must get in mind a clear picture of the things he desired so that the creative thought of them might be impressed upon formless substance. He was a very poor man living in a rented house and having only what he earned from day to day, and he could not grasp the fact that all wealth was his. So after thinking the matter over, he decided that he might reasonably ask for a new rug for the floor of his best room and an anthracite coal stove to heat the house during the cold winter. Following the instructions given in this book, he obtained these things in a few months, and then it dawned upon him that he had not asked enough. He went through the house in which he lived and planned all the improvements he would make in it. He mentally added a bay window here and a room there until it was complete in his mind as his ideal home. And then he planned its furnishings. Holding the picture in his mind, he began living in the certain way and moving toward what he wanted. And he owns the house now and is rebuilding it after the form of his mental image. And now with still larger faith, he is going on to get greater things. 
It has been unto him according to his faith, and it is so with you and with all of us. Chapter 7, Gratitude. Ah, yeah. The illustrations given in the last chapter will have conveyed to the reader the fact that the first step toward getting rich is to convey the idea of your wants to the formless substance. This is true. And you will see that in order to do so, it becomes necessary to relate yourself to the formless intelligence in a harmonious way. To secure this harmonious relation is a matter of such primary and vital importance that I shall give some space to its discussion here and give you instructions, which if you follow them, will be certain to bring you into perfect unity of mind with God. The whole process of mental adjustment and atonement can be summed up in one word, gratitude. First, you believe that there is one intelligent substance from which all things proceed. Second, you believe that this substance gives you everything you desire. And third, you relate yourself to it by a feeling of deep and profound gratitude. Many people who order their lives rightly in all other ways are kept in poverty by their lack of gratitude. Having received one gift from God, they cut the wires which connect them with him by failing to make acknowledgement. It is easy to understand that the nearer we live to the source of wealth, the more wealth we shall receive. And it is easy also to understand that the soul that is always grateful lives in closer touch with God than the one which never looks to him in thankful acknowledgement. Let me just read part of that again. The nearer we live to the source of wealth, the more wealth we shall receive. I love that. The more gratefully we fix our minds on the supreme when good things come to us, the more good things we will receive, and the more rapidly they will come. And the reason simply is that the mental attitude of gratitude draws the mind into closer touch with the source from which the blessings come. If it is a new thought to you that gratitude brings your whole mind into closer harmony with the creative energies of the universe, consider it well and you will see that it is true. The good things you already have have come to you along the line of obedience to certain laws. Gratitude will lead your mind out along the ways by which things come, and it will keep you in close harmony with creative thought and prevent you from falling into competitive thought. Gratitude alone can keep you looking toward the all and prevent you from falling into the error of thinking of the supply as limited. And to do that would be fatal to your hopes. There is a law of gratitude and it is absolutely necessary that you should observe the law if you are to get the results you seek. The law of gratitude is the natural principle that action and reaction are always equal and in opposite directions. The grateful outreaching of your mind in thankful praise to the Supreme is a liberation or expenditure of force. It cannot fail to reach that to which it addressed, and the reaction is an instantaneous movement towards you. Draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. That is a statement of psychological truth. And if your gratitude is strong and constant, the reaction in formless substance will be strong and continuous. The movement of the things you want will be always toward you. Notice the grateful attitude that Jesus took, how he always seems to be saying, I thank thee, Father, for thou hearest me. You cannot exercise much power without gratitude, for it is gratitude that keeps you connected with power. But the value of gratitude does not consist solely in getting you more blessings in the future. Without gratitude, you cannot long keep from dissatisfied thought regarding things as they are. The moment you permit your mind to dwell with dissatisfaction upon things as they are, you begin to lose ground. You fix attention upon the common, the ordinary, the poor, and the squalid, and the mean. And your mind takes the form of these things. Then you will transmit these forms or mental images to the formless, and the common, the poor, the squalid, and the mean will come to you. 
To permit your mind to dwell upon the inferior is to become inferior and to surround yourself with inferior things. On the other hand, to fix your attention on the best is to surround yourself with the best and to become the best. The creative power within us makes us into the image of that to which we give our attention. We are thinking substance, and thinking substance always takes the form of that which it thinks about. The grateful mind is constantly fixed upon the best. Therefore, it tends to become the best. It takes the form or character of the best and will receive the best. Also, faith is born of gratitude. The grateful mind continually expects good things, and expectation becomes faith. The reaction of gratitude upon one's own mind produces faith, and every outgoing wave of grateful thanksgiving increases faith. He who has no feeling of gratitude cannot long retain a living faith, and without a living faith, you cannot get rich by the creative method, as we shall see in the following chapters. It is necessary then to cultivate the habit of being grateful for every good thing that comes to you and to give thanks continuously. And because all things have contributed to your advancement, you should include all things in your gratitude. Do not waste time thinking or talking about the shortcomings or wrong actions of plutocrats or trust magnates. Their organization of the world has made your opportunity. All you get really comes to you because of them. Do not rage against corrupt politicians. If it were not for politicians, we should fall into anarchy and your opportunity would be greatly lessened. God has worked a long time and very patiently to bring us up to where we are in industry and government, and he is going right on with his work. There is not the least doubt that he will do away with plutocrats, trust magnates, captains of industry, and politicians as soon as they can be spared. But in the meantime, behold, they are all very good. Remember that they are all helping to arrange the lines of transmission along which your riches will come to you and be grateful to them all. This will bring you into harmonious relations with the good in everything and the good in everything will move toward you. Chapter eight, thinking in the certain way. Turn back to chapter six and read again the story of the man who formed a mental image of his house, and you will get a fair idea of the initial step toward getting rich. You must form a clear and definite mental picture of what you want. You cannot transmit an idea unless you have it yourself. You must have it before you can give it. And many people fail to impress thinking substance because they have themselves only a vague or misty concept of the things they want to do, to have, or to become. It is not enough that you should have a general desire for wealth to do good with. Everybody has that desire. It is not enough that you should have a wish to travel, see things, live more, etc. Everybody has those desires also. If you were going to send a wireless message to a friend, you would not send the letters of the alphabet in their order and let him construct the message for himself, nor would you take words at random from the dictionary. You would send a coherent sentence, one which meant something. When you try to impress your wants upon substance, remember that it must be done by a coherent statement. You must know what you want and be definite. You can never get rich or start the creative power into action by sending out unformed longings and vague desires. Go over your desires just as the man I have described went over his house. See just what you want and get a clear mental picture of it as you wish it to look when you get it. That clear mental picture you must have continually in mind as the sailor has in mind the port toward which he is sailing the ship. You must keep your face toward it at all time. You must no more lose sight of it than the steersman loses sight of the compass. It is not necessary to take exercises in concentration, nor to set apart special times for prayer and affirmation, nor to go into the silence, nor to do occult stunts of any kind. <laughs> These things are well enough, but all you need is to know what you want and to want it badly enough so that it will stay in your thoughts. 
Spend as much of your leisure time as you can in contemplating your picture, but no one needs to take exercises to concentrate his mind on a thing which he really wants. It is the things you do not really care about which require effort to fix your attention upon them. And unless you really want to get rich, so that the desire is strong enough to hold your thoughts directed to the purpose as the magnetic pole holds the needle of the compass, it will hardly be worthwhile for you to try to carry out the instructions given in this book. The methods herein set forth are for people whose desire for riches is strong enough to overcome mental laziness and the love of ease and make them work. The more clear and definite you make your picture then, and the more you dwell upon it, bringing out all of its delightful details, the stronger your desire will be. And the stronger your desire, the easier it will be to hold your mind fixed upon the picture of what you want. Something more is necessary, however, than merely to see the picture clearly. If that is all you do, you are only a dreamer and will have little or no power for accomplishment. Behind your clear vision must be the purpose to realize it, to bring it out in tangible expression. And behind this purpose must be an invincible and unwavering faith that the thing is already yours, that it is at hand, and you have only to take possession of it. Live in the new house mentally until it takes form around you physically. In the mental realm, enter at once into full enjoyment of the things you want. Whatsoever things ye ask for when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them, said Jesus. I get tripped up on all those yees, this old school language. See the things you want as if they were actually around you all the time. See yourself as owning and using them. Make use of them in imagination just as you will use them when they are your tangible possessions. Dwell upon your mental picture until it is clear and distinct, and then take the mental attitude of ownership toward everything in that picture. Take possession of it in mind in the full faith that it is actually yours. Hold to this mental ownership. Do not waver for an instant in the faith that it is real. And remember what was said in a proceeding chapter about gratitude. Be as thankful for it all the time as you expect to be when it has taken form. The man who can sincerely thank God for the things which as yet he owns only in imagination has real faith. He will get rich. He will cause the creation of whatsoever he wants. You do not need to pray repeatedly for things you want. It is not necessary to tell God about it every day. Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, said Jesus to his pupils. For your father knoweth that ye have need of these things before ye ask him. Your part is to intelligently formulate your desire for the things which make for a larger life, and to get these desires arranged into a coherent whole, and then to impress this whole desire upon the formless substance, which has the power and the will to bring you what you want. You do not make this impression by repeating strings of words. You make it by holding the vision with unshakable purpose to attain it and with steadfast faith that you do attain it. The answer to prayer is not according to your faith while you are talking, but according to your faith while you are working. You cannot impress the mind of God by having a special Sabbath day set apart to tell him what you want and then forgetting him during the rest of the week. You cannot impress him by having special hours to go into your closet and pray if you then dismiss the matter from your mind until the hour of prayer comes again. Oral prayer is well enough and has its effect, especially upon yourself, in clarifying your vision and strengthening your faith. But it is not your oral petitions which get you what you want. In order to get rich, you do not need a, quote, sweet hour of prayer. You need to quote, pray without ceasing. And by prayer, I mean holding steadily to your vision with the purpose to cause its creation into solid form and the faith that you are doing so. Believe that ye receive them. The whole matter turns on receiving once you have clearly formed your vision. 
When you have formed it, it is well to make an oral statement, addressing the Supreme in reverent prayer. And from that moment, you must, in mind, receive what you ask for. Live in the new house, wear the fine clothes, ride in the automobile, go on the journey, and confidently plan for greater journeys. Think and speak of all the things you have asked for in terms of actual present ownership. Imagine an environment and a financial condition exactly as you want them, and live all the time in that imaginary environment and financial condition. Mind, however, that you do not do this as a mere dreamer and castle builder. Hold to the faith that the imaginary is being realized, and to the purpose to realize it. Remember that it is faith and purpose in the use of imagination which will make the difference between the scientist and the dreamer. And having learned this fact, it is here that you must learn the proper use of will. And that concludes today's reading. I look forward to being with you again tomorrow. Thanks so much for listening. Make sure to subscribe to The Lucrative Society on iTunes. And please leave a review of the podcast. Visit lucra.com for transcripts and resources or to become a member of The Lucrative Society, where I coach purpose-based entrepreneurs on business, mindset, and heartset. Lucra, where wealth equals well-being.